today joining us. John, in particular, thank you very much for, for being with us today and, and sharing your insights on this really important topic. Um, my name is Joe Neal. I'm the general business in the Institute of Technology of Lunchtime. Um, my name is Natalie O'Donnell. I'm also doing general business. I'm also in the sustainability class and I'm here because I just want to learn as much as I can. I'm studying on um, BBS, Budapest Business School, International Relations and sadly I don't have a sustainability uh, class. <laughs> I'm not a student anymore, but I'm surrounded by uh, master's students of uh, international studies, so you know I'm in good comp company. My name is Majern. I'm in electronics engineering. My name's Christian, and I'm in a general arts and science program. And I take this class because I'm really curious about different people around the world and different cultures. Thank you for the opportunity, and good day to you all. The theme for today is peak oil. Is it a blessing in disguise? We are currently consuming about 96 million barrels of oil a day. We are currently producing just a little bit more than 96 million barrels a day. So oil is in close equilibrium between the supply and the demand. We have climbed in the last 12 years about almost 8 million barrels a day of consumption. In 2005, the big issue of the day in the United States <clears throat> is what year will we reach peak oil? And peak oil is defined as the highest level of oil consumption or oil production that the world will know, following which there is a long receding period of using less oil. There remain several billion people on the earth with no access to oil or natural gas. They want access to oil and natural gas. There are nearly a billion automobiles on the roads of the world, and those automobiles, 99 point something percent, all rely on oil products. Add 33 years to your current age. It's estimated that the world will be using approximately the same amount of oil as we are using today. That's an amazing statistic confirmed by three different studies from three different sources. The use of fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, produces an extraordinary amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which I believe contributes to man-made pollution of the atmosphere. Oil is not everywhere. Oil is located where the geology of the earth has created such oil. And as we know today, the Middle East is a part of the world on fire, and the killing is not going to stop because there's nothing on earth that is capable of stopping it, which will continue to affect geopolitics for the future as far as we can see out. Meanwhile, Russia, China, United States, Western Europe, primary consumers of oil, primary producers of oil, all of them, and they will continue to depend on oil. Environmental impact and geopolitical impact are two huge negatives. The positives of oil. It is a tremendous source of energy. Without that oil, we don't fly. Without that oil, we don't use water transport. Without that oil, we don't use automobiles or trucks and we are a world that is entirely dependent upon mobility. Basic fundamental human needs, clothes, housing, and food, are critically dependent upon oil. What about the light? What about the electrons from natural gas that fuel our computers, our ability to communicate, our social networking? Then there's medicine, healthcare. Then there's the whole defense and security mechanism of the world. Peace is secured by the use of oil products. In order to, to become part of the developed world, the only way forward is with increased amounts of energy. And the two billion people or more that don't have access to energy are crying for energy. But I believe we are a long way from losing our dependence on oil. So far, most lithium is from South America. Is it, It's a much smaller limitation than oil. Do you think that that will be a good alternative for a long period of time or is it just a short one until we find something else? 
the quest or the search for more lithium is ongoing. And there is a lot of lithium in the world, but it's not easily obtained. The mining of lithium is a filthy, dirty process that consumes enormous amounts of water. The environmental issues aren't going away uh, with respect to electronics and batteries any more than they are currently going away with respect to fossil fuels. So we're a dirty people, folks. <laughs> we are a dirty people. I'm putting that down. If a student wanted to make a career um, in a field that is constantly evolving and adapting, and clearly energy is, is one of these fields, um, what's a student have to do? In addition to being a dirty people, we are largely an ignorant people. We do not know the facts, and the facts matter. Where we have regulations in place, and where those regulations are honored and enforced, we have sustainable production of oil and natural gas. It's where we violate the rules. It's where we don't enforce the regulation. That's where we have serious problems. Do you think that John is answering that question in terms of environmental consciousness? Or is he just answering the question like any big oil CEO would answer? That was an amazing answer. We were all glued to the screen, right? But it had nothing to do with the question. Basically, your, your job as a CEO is, in many ways, is to influence people, right? So how would you influence the students, the groups that are right, right here, right now, listening to you, to do as you see, as, to, you know, follow a path that you would deem correct? There is nothing ideological about a molecule or an electron. An electron is not democratic or republican socialist or conservative. We currently have this anomalous situation in the US where Barack Obama had a certain ideology about energy and Donald Trump has a certain ideology about energy. And guess what? America's going backwards, not forwards. So my advice to both influence people like CEOs or to students becoming aware of the world in which they live Go with facts. Go with pragmatics. That requires an open mind. It requires a curiosity of additional learning. It requires an openness of discussion. Don't panic. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Humans can solve it. Do you take that view? Yeah. You just got to, uh, you know, tie in the economics, right? Incentivize people to uh, do all these things. Is there such a thing, John, as peak oil? I do not believe that today's generations living on Earth will see peak fossil fuel in their lifetime. The issue okay. of peak is not yet known because the availability of oil is huge. The affordability of oil is very good. And the need for oil is great. Is there anything that's equal or better that, we, that could compete with it, uh, natural or like human made? I think the 21st century will be primarily transitional. But in the 22nd century, if things work well, and if we stay focused on the future, we could see wind and solar, free sources of energy, as primary sources of electrons. And we could see biomass grown regularly in temperate zones of the world as the primary source of feedstock for all the chemicals that we use today. Like, say my generation starts working on that now. Yeah. Can we reduce that, like, effect of getting to that level of peak oil? If the efforts aren't organized and consistent across a very large population, then the impact of what you're doing is minimal at best. The world came together in Paris in December 2015 to sign the Paris Accords a UN-led effort to affect global climate change, but there is no assurance, no guarantee, no enforcement of what was agreed to by all of these nations in Paris. President Trump doesn't believe the scientific evidence about global warming. People who are supported by a political party or political money or political endeavor are the least efficient to make the decisions of environment or energy. I don't trust politicians. 
Obama begot Trump. What a nightmare. Yeah, just... <laughs> what a nightmare. Why don't we set up a common system of energy and environmental regulatory bodies that are filled with subject matter experts to deal with the environmental and the energy needs of the world in a similar fashion to how we deal with the monetary needs of the world. If you study the 1950s, you will understand Donald Trump. That's when he grew up. That's when he learned what he knows. And he shut off his learning capability sometime after the 1950s. And 1950s was a great decade for the United States. We didn't think much about the environment. And we got on with prosperity. And, and so that's where Donald Trump's head is. I personally don't think that's good enough for the 2020, excuse me, the 2020s. But it is what it is. If we want great energy, we want to get around faster, and we want to do all these things. It's, is, it, is there a possibility that it, there's no equal? It's one, if you do one, then the, you lose the other. <laughs> it's a very good the question. Balance. And it's, yeah. it reflects the dilemma of life. We can make choices that compromise, choices that have long-term benefits, choices that have short-term benefits. And what are the choices that we intend to make? I think, for example, if you replace cars with horses, you end up with eight feet deep manure every morning in New York City. It's that big of a problem. Horses are dirtier than cars. <laughs> now, the, the atmosphere takes away the waste of the cars. People would have to take away the waste of the horses. Public transportation. It's a marvelous way of mobility. It's freedom at low cost per capita. Cars are an expensive alternative, but we make the choice in North America in particular to emphasize cars over public transport. So there are options out there for all of us and it's up to intelligent people with knowledge to make those choices. And I'm afraid we too often don't make good choices. According to my research and writing, we will be a CO2 free energy system if we get our act together in the 21st century by the second half of the 21st century. But every day, every year we delay and we've delayed 17 years so far in this century. And the more we delay, the longer it will take. Uh, all I would say is thank you for the opportunity. And if there's a chance in the future, I would love to come back again. Thank you. For sure. Thank you very much. See you again in the global class, guys. Take care.